Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for attending, and I want to thank everybody who's here in person as well. Um, just a few notes from the PCO. I'm Cheryl Rumpa, co-president of the PCO. I want to thank any uh, eighth grade parents who helped out with the eighth grade social this past weekend. Um, and you know, just a few reminders that we are going to be looking for the appreciation week that comes up. We're going to be looking for some information um, for that. You'll be able to make some information. And then we still have the eighth grade moving up coming in. We're going to be looking for volunteers for that as well. So keep an eye out for anything we're sending out about those events. Um, and now I would like to introduce Mr. Sierras, who will be talking to us about the PBIS program. Great. Thank you very much. Would you like me to unmute you and drop you back down so you don't have to be on the uh, screen? Hold on one second. Um, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe. There we go. All right. Good morning. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to speak to uh, the people here. We'll probably do a little bit of referencing uh, what I'll just put up on the screen. So let me share my screen first um, and say thank you all for coming. Um, so we will uh, go through a little presentation today about what PBIS is. Um, so it starts as positive behaviors, interventions, and supports. So what I've done is I've tried to link this um, link this to uh, through the invitation, there was a little bit of a um, a web address, and that takes you to to a question about the like why PBIS? What does it mean? Why would we do that in a school? And so just from a like a macro level, um, PBIS um, is something that is throughout the United States. It is at all levels. I will tell you, it is more at the elementary level. That's kind of where I got its start with thinking about like, what are the behaviors we want kids to show in school, et cetera. It has moved its way up into middle school. I think there are some high schools that use it, but probably not very many, to be honest with you. Um, I, when I was an assistant principal in Ridgefield, we brought this to uh, the middle school in, in Ridgefield. And the major questions from teachers and parents were, we have really well-behaved kids. Like, why do we want to put so much focus and attention on behaviors and interventions and supports for our students that we know are really well behaved. <clears throat> and so I'm hoping that we'll be able to answer that question today uh, by the time we leave. Good morning. Um, so just as a, again, kind of like a macro level from, um, from PBIS, kind of like the three major areas we wanna talk about in improved student outcomes. Um, reduce ex exclusionary discipline. Again, we don't have a lot of that here. So that's probably, if we were to rank these, that would probably be one of the lower ones. And then improve teacher outcomes, which I think we all we all would want. Um, again, from a, from a research perspective, we're talking about PBIS establishing a healthy culture and climate, increasing student engagement and instructional time. And I think what you'll see is kind of like our focus probably is there. Um, more than anywhere is the increased student engagement and instructional time. Um, empower students to play a central role in their own education, reduces racial inequities uh, in discipline, uh, reduces teacher burnout, and makes all of your other practices better. So um, again, from a research perspective of why implement PBIS, I think these are some of our reasons. And I think coming through the pandemic, we all noticed that there was a change, kind of like a pre-pandemic behavior and a post-pandemic behavior. Those of you with children have probably seen the same thing, right? Kids are more connected with their cell phones than they were for the pandemic. Some of that, for those of you in the room, is because your kids are at an age where they're more socially connected. They have phones, but they might not have uh, prior to. Um, but, uh, uh, but that's what we're also combating in school, is that like this is an appendage now. It's a third arm, it's a, an 11th finger, like kids really struggle to be without their phones. And so that's one norm that has shifted for us, but we've seen others shift as well. So we were hearing that from our teachers last year, and we said like toward the end of the year, 
we asked a question in our faculty meeting, what is the most important behavior you'd like to see improved in next year's classrooms? Very open-ended. Um, and I'll show you in a minute an example. We got 50, 58 responses. Some people work together in our faculty meeting and kind of like put things in together. Some people put things in individually, but we collect a lot of information from our teachers <clears throat> based on surveys at faculty meetings so that if somebody's not there, their voice can still be represented. So these were some of the examples. Um, so I'll just read some for you if you didn't bring your glasses, whatever, but um, showing up to class on time and with materials. Like think back to your own schooling. Is that something that a lot of the a lot of your class did, or can you probably remember those like two or three kids that didn't? Right. And what we were saying is that more than two or three kids were showing up to class late and without materials. So that's a, a, a behavior that we were seeing. Bring water bottles, spending hours at the water, the water cooler, getting to class on time. So you've heard that getting to class on time. Classroom etiquette of like not sharpening a pencil when a teacher is speaking. But think about that, right? So kids were online. When they had a need, they just muted and they just did whatever they needed to do. If they needed to go to the bathroom, they needed to get a snack. Like they just did those things. And so like, why wouldn't they just do that when they need to in class? So it's like, it sounds so like, again, for all of us who have been through school, like, yeah, of course you wouldn't sharpen your pencil when a teacher is talking. But like paying attention to those little types of behaviors, like we have to teach into that. Um, because our kids don't have those skills. So again, uh, treating other with kindness, that was a big one. Um, you can see the coming to class on time is a big one. Um, coming to class prepared, um, charge devices is a huge piece that kids will just go home, leave their device in their backpack and come back the next day and it will not be charged. Uh, active listening, that we spent a lot of time on that, to be honest with you. We spent a lot of time on that before the pandemic, like, just because a kid is not doodling, does that really mean that they are actively listening? So we've spent some time talking about that. Um, mingling in the hallways, um, on time for school, exhibiting empathy, appropriate language we heard a lot. Again, I think with kids outside of the school, those norms shifted. Um, potentially, I think we've talked about this before, but potentially households do allow a little more swearing at home. And when kids come into school, we have to say like, when you step on the bus, the rules are different. And they weren't different for our kids for one, two years of, during the pandemic. So that that's like, you can see through this, you can probably sense like a little bit of frustration, right? And you can also sense like, longing for when these things were established in our culture. And so that's kind of like how we looked at it um, in the lens of PBIS of establishing like a positive behavior culture and just saying like explicitly, this is what we want um, was important to us. So what we did was we took all of those different unique things and we went through a practice of trying to categorize them in some way. So we actually took all of these, these unique pieces and we wrote them on individual post-it notes. And then we said, okay, like how can we categorize these things? Like we can't just say be on time to class. I mean, we can, but does that fall within like a larger umbrella of something else? So what we try to do is we try to categorize things like you can see, we started to do like technology use, um, we were there questions about sustainability, pride in their work, kindness, respect, kind of like a school norms, a being prepared to class, a responsibility. Good morning. And, and that was one piece. The other side, we looked at uh, kindness, kind of like hallway expectations around safety, um, school rules, again, technology, respect, et cetera. So, <clears throat> We said to people like, what do you wanna see? If we go back to the question, what is the most important behavior you'd like to see improved in next year's classrooms? And even though we asked the question that way, we heard, we saw some people say like, I, I want to see this, that's the okay when you look at this graph. And some people said like, 
I don't want to see this. Like I want this extinguished. So when we looked at kind of like our list of things that we got back from our teachers, there were some that framed them positively and there were some that framed them negatively. So that's just kind of like how we looked at the data. And then we tried to break them down kind of into our categories. So again, you'll see like a kindness category, there were 16 total. And then like, there were more examples, of like more non-examples, if that makes sense the way I'm saying it. So like, um, uh, like um, if somebody said bullying, like stop bullying, that would be a not okay behavior. If somebody said like, um, treat each other with uh, the way you'd want to be treated. That would be an okay behavior. And so we went through. So like, again, a safety piece, people are just going to say like, I want this extinguished, like no running in the hallways, stay to the right in the hallways. So we have like good traffic patterns, that kind of thing. Um, school norms were always framed positively. I hope, I hope like all that makes sense. <clears throat> you can see what our biggest categories were. We're being respectful, being responsible. I will tell you that throughout PBIS, they, it usually falls into three categories. And those three categories are safety, respect, and responsibility. So our, our teachers, without knowing that, kind of categorize things the exact same way that we would traditionally see kind of the emphasis put on in both, whether it be elementary or middle school. So that you can see that we took our time, we listened to our teachers, we're examining the data to try to find out like what is that place where we want to focus our energy um, as we come back here. So then we said, okay, where would the where would we see these types of behaviors? So you can see like, and so we try to break down on like kindness, respect, and responsibility and recategorize about like our desired behaviors and our like not okay behaviors. And you can see where the preponderance of evidence was, right? So we're asking teachers, what do they want to improve? And they're telling us, we want to improve things in the classroom. That makes sense, right? That that's where the evidence comes from. So we decided as a group that we were going to focus on classroom first. We were not going to focus on the hallway. We were not going to focus on technology. We were not going to fo focus on like kind of like the other areas or sustainability. We were going to pour our attention in the classroom because that's where most of these post-it notes were coming from. So then we took all those different things and we said, okay, let's try to create a matrix. PBIS is really, really big on creating a matrix. It should literally almost like what's posted on the wall there. It should be posted in every classroom. So throughout the building, the, the expectations are the same. It doesn't matter if it's a chorus classroom or a PE classroom or a technology classroom or an English classroom, et cetera. The norm should be the same throughout. So this is just literally us taking all of these and typing them into uh, what we thought would be a desired matrix. So now the not okay is something that we had to get rid of. We knew that because the, the first word in PBIS is positive. So we don't want to say like, a big part of PBIS is you don't say like, stop running. You don't say don't run in the halls. You say, we walk here, like right? We walk in the halls at John Jay Middle School. It's a respectful conversation. It's you're reminding people of a norm, students of a norm. And so when we actually came back to it, this was our first, and we're talking about several meetings here. This was our first real glance at what a positively be framed behavioral expectation was of a matrix that stemmed from our teachers' expectations and concerns from last June. So this took us probably until about January this year to really kind of like focus our attention. Uh, we spend about three to five hours per month um, with a group of teachers, school psychologists, um, TAs, um, and administrators here in the building. So when we think about it, safety, what does safety mean? It can mean walking in the hallways. It can mean what we try to come up with for a definition, making it safe for others, caring about yourself and others. It's not just about you. Really, that is kind of like a, a big theme that I think came through in some of our pieces is kids do wanna take care of themselves and that's very adolescent, that's very middle school appropriate. 
and that we are part of a bigger community. So some of the things we said, like keep your personal space personal. So when you come in, your things should be like not interfering with the safety of others. That was one of the major reasons after the pandemic that we moved back to lockers because kids were coming in with backpacks and they were just dropping them. Um, our classrooms were crowded with all that extra thing. It wasn't safe. And kids, some kids were very good about it. They put it on the back of their chair. Others, they drop it. Their Chromebook falls out or their device falls out. Their papers are everywhere. So um, keeping personal space personal. Consider the impacts of your words on others. Restore and repair relationships if you happen to have um, a mishap. Beware and remember um, where you are. So like I said before, like you're not at home where swearing is acceptable. You're at school. You're not at home or on the... Um, so like one of the things we talk about a lot during recess is like, it's not a refereed soccer game right now, right? There's no referee to blow the whistles. Like we are going to ask you to be less physical than you would be on a refereed game um, because our, the safety of everybody is, is important. Remain quiet while others are speaking. That's a very respectful thing. Seek to understand. So if you don't know, just don't say like, that person must be stupid or misinformed or whatever, but like, tell me more about that is something that we wanted to teach into. And then if you see something, say something. So it's not just okay to watch somebody be harmed in any way. If you see something, say something. Then we got into a really good conversation as a group about respect versus dignity. Do you all know the difference between respect and dignity? Want to give it a shot? So I won't like I won't make this like a seventh grade classroom right now. Um, so respect is something you've probably heard the expression at some point in your life. Respect is earned, right? If I respect you, you respect me. Dignity is something that like everybody is afforded as a human being, right? So what we do see, especially in like the social hierarchy of middle school, is that some people feel like they are the haves. And then there are others who are the have nots and like they may not, they might not deserve to be treated the same way. And really what, what the focus of the word dignity is, is it's like, but we're all humans. Like just because you got there first doesn't mean that the other person has a less of a right to play a game or have their voice heard in the classroom. So that's why we had a really good conversation around respect versus dignity. And we ended up landing more toward like a dignity uh, aspect. Um, so on our working agreements, um, we talked about like your word being your bond, being an active listener, thinking before you're speaking, you're, you're speaking like, are there people here? There's a lot of work we do in the school with pronouns. So like, it's yeah, like, I'm terrible with pronouns. I've done so many apologies because I grew up speaking like grammatically correct and I can't say the word like they talking to one person and I know I have to, like it's such a struggle for me. And so like, I'm trying to think before I act and I'm definitely apologizing when I do it wrong. Um, and people are very, you know, kids are very accepting of that. Um, accept others for who they are. <clears throat> this is a really hard one for middle school students. Knowing what is fair isn't always equal, and what's equal isn't always fair. Um, I mean, you can probably think of anything if you've got more than one child at home. You can probably think of how this applies to the children in your own in your own household. Um, but it is really, really hard. <clears throat> we have had a situation this year of which I'll try to do my best without. Um, describing the situation identifiably. Um, but there is a student with uh, disabilities and part of that disability is that the student is kind of like louder than a lot of other students. And so what does that loudness do is it brings other kids into that child's life and the decisions and the, when the child gets upset and when they're not upset, et cetera. And so there's this feeling of like, but that kid gets to do it, why can't I? <clears throat> think about dignity, think about like, what's fair isn't always equal. That's helping us have some of these conversations. 
Um, and it's still not easy to have that conversation with an adolescent. But I saw him or her do this. Why can't I do it? That's not fair. And like, that's a really, I, I could see some of your faces thinking like, yep, I can use this at home. Um, honestly, this, these, this type of language, this positively framed language does help at home. It really does. Uh, we don't speak to each other like we, you know, we're active. We let each other finish speaking, et cetera. Anyway, too many asides. Um, responsibility, taking ownership of the learning. So do your best. Ask questions to understand. Don't just say, I don't get it. Um, attend to the lesson and commit to the learning. Um, be on time. That We saw a bunch of that at the beginning. Be on time with what you need to succeed and turn mistakes into learning opportunities. Don't just say, I'm stupid. I don't get it. But like, okay, I made a mistake. That's okay. Now, how can I learn from that? So that was a couple of um, maybe a month or two ago. And then we said, okay, what are we really, really trying to do? Like, let's put it out there on a table as a group. And then let's re-examine this, our school-wide expectations against our norms. So we agreed as a group that we wanted to teach into the behaviors that we want to see. So that means that there would be a lesson as to what something means that we expect. So go back to being on time with what you need to succeed. So if the bell rings at 9.53, which is what it is right now, you have three minutes to get to your next class. And you are expected in that class to bring blank. You know what the expectations are. And so my expectations of it as a teacher are that you'll have your, you'll have your device, you'll have something to write with, and you'll have your homework, whatever that would be. They might be a little bit different from class to class and that that is okay, but that you will come be on time with what you need to succeed. Realistic and clear expectations of what it looks like and what it sounds like. So we may be recording videos of what that looks like, being on time, in your place, being ready with what you need to be successful. And then we'll probably also provide examples of what are called non-examples. So we'll have a kid stumbling in late, dropping materials, that kind of thing. So we have the examples and the non-examples through PBIS. Understanding and differentiating when appropriate, right? So we do need to consider our students who learn differently. Um, and so uh, we need to be able to differentiate our expectations that way. Uh, shared understanding on the importance of teaching the behaviors, uh, developmentally appropriate, uh, making sure that they are middle school appropriate, um, the volume of undesired behaviors. So again, like we need to look at this and say like, what is the most important, right? What needs to be the first day of school as opposed to maybe like a couple of months in. Um, the impact of 2009. So we looked historically. Do y'all remember what was happening in 2009? when the, our kids were being born, like this group was being born. Like that was right after like a stock market crash and right after the banks uh, went down. So we're looking at potentially like kids being born into a family where somebody has lost a job or there was a major economic impact. Those are things that we do have to look into when we're considering a group of kids. Um, need for, an, oh, sorry. A need for an increased understanding of trauma enforced. Again, that's kind of that piece, but also thinking about uh, the pandemic. Adjusting expectations on arrested development, right? So those years of virtual. We do see kids, uh, sixth graders who are behaving as probably younger students would traditionally, eighth graders who are, are behaving as, because they've had that arrested development, they haven't had that growth. Our current eighth grade came into a school that was hybrid. They were here every other day. They had masks on. Actually, they were here for what, two days out of, out of five. That's a huge shift as compared with groups before and groups after. And we need to be able to acknowledge that in our expectation. Students are always watching and learning from us, right? So like the teachers need to model that behavior. Like I said before, if we come out and say, don't run, then that's a negatively framed expectation where we would want some positively framed expectations. And then student understandings that adults are not perfect, right? And that they will, they will make mistakes sometimes. And, and that is part of the, the repairing of a relationship. So we looked at that and we said, okay, how can we change kind of some of these to become 
uh, different expectations. We are not done with this work, by the way. I do want to let you know that our faculty meeting a couple of weeks ago, we constantly are asking. We have a group of about 13 to 15 people that meet monthly, but we want to make sure that the rest of the faculty also continues to be involved. So we would say, like, we'd post this and say, what's good and what needs to improve. So like, if there's any language up there um, that you're confused about, let us know now so we can build that in. So keep your body objects and unkind words to yourself. That's a new kind of like safety expectation. Speak up if you see something, say something and be honest. Do you see a little bit of a pattern with the be honest piece? Um, respect, when you know better, do better. Actively include others in meaningful ways. So again, we'd probably see that more in group work, probably see that in like hallway, We'd see that in the cafeteria. We'd see that at, at recess. Um, seek to understand without judgment. So tell me what you're thinking. Tell me why you act that way. Tell me a little bit more instead of just saying like you're bad or you're other. And again, be honest and then be on time with what you need to succeed. Learn from your mistakes. Take ownership of yourself and learning. Be an active learner and an active listener. You see be honest up here a number of times. I'm interested in what all of you are seeing at home. Um, we will see students, like we'll see them do something and then they'll say, I didn't do that. And so I'm just, I'm curious what you're seeing at home um, in terms of the honesty piece. Are you seeing anything different? Or are you seeing like, listen, I lied to my parents about doing my homework. Um, but I think there's probably more accountability for that maybe than there was when we were growing up. But I don't know. Definitely seeing. Um, Mom, remember the other day when I like, yeah. told you, like, <clears throat> well, that was kind of true, kind of not. Yeah, let's, let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Before. Tell me what was it. Um, and, and I'm really, really loving that because they're kids. Yeah. They're going yep. to, you know, they're figuring it out now. Yeah. And what we have to do is make it as comfortable to have those conversations. Because sometimes I'll be like, you knew that already, but I'm so glad you yeah. moved this up. Yeah. Uh, and just taking ownership for more of, you know, what, what's, what's going on. And also, um, especially like the parent of the brother. Yeah. I've seen a lot more of this, which is amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Um, Y'all heard the term restorative justice? Do you know what it means? <laughs> so, so honestly, like restorative justice means that there was kind of like this idealistic relationship, expectation, whatever, and that that has been broken in some way. So the restorative piece is saying like, let's bring it back to what it was idealistically. Like, so in our classrooms, we're talking about like having a culture in your classroom. And so if somebody does something that is outside the norm, that disrupts that, um, then we say we have to like restore and repair what that relationship or what that culture is or what that like brother sister relationship is. And so like that is vitally important. Yes, there are still gonna be consequences. Like there might be consequences from lying to mom. There may be consequences from the thing that the child did like in the space and we also need to restore and repair that relationship. Otherwise, you other somebody, right? You're that kid that like made that weird comment a couple of years ago. It's like, no, I'm, I took ownership of it and I apologized. And so like, that's, uh, that's an important piece. So whether it's in a family relationship or in a classroom or between a teacher and a, a student, like um, it needs to be repaired. So kind of like our next steps of work, just kind of wanted to share with you where we continue to go, uh, deciding on the method of getting student input. We do not have student input yet uh, into our matrix and we need to. Identifying lesson topics, like we talked about before, needing to teach into that, defining the what and how of school-wide matrix core values, uh, developing shared goals, and identifying teacher supports and a plan. Um, and then just kind of like our next work. But you can see like clarity, student-friendly, consolidation, and including like examples of what that might look like.
All right, so that is kind of like where we've been and taking you kind of like up to speed right now. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. We hope to have a launch for next fall. So we're pretty close. You can see the work that we've done to get to this point. And now we have to really say like, is this where we want it to be, the matrix piece about these school-wide expectations? And then provide examples, start like actually doing video recordings and put some lessons together so that our teachers can teach into what we expect that to be at the beginning of next year. And start yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, so like the reason that we do include and keep sharing is that we do want to make sure that like our language and our expectations are there. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there are going to be people that are hesitant to say like, I don't want to do this wrong. And I'm respectful of that. So there are people who are like, <clears throat> I think we have one or two people on staff who did some PBIS work in their undergraduate work. Mm -hmm. They've already started this work in their classrooms. Like they have to be safe, be responsible, be respectful. They've always had that language up in their classrooms. Um, and they like they remind students of what that feels like in their space. This will look a little bit different depending, like if you're in a band class, it's gonna look different than an English class, just is. Um, correct, right. So like teachers are gonna talk about what that means in their specific classroom. Like, um, anyway, I won't get into the examples, but yes. great question about the high school um that this is where that those details came from sure Sorry, Steve. Sorry, Steve. yeah yep isn't it isn't it unbelievable yeah 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 Maybe the culture was injured because the right person, but um, during COVID, yeah, such that we need to be reinforced. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think maybe I think it was. Yeah, because like common sense, common courtesy, kind of what I thought. Of. Yeah, we were saying how sharpening a pencil. Yeah, like it's just common courtesy. Yeah, but it's just, unfortunately society. Yep, during COVID lost. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, like, that's, I agree. I think I probably noticed it societally, right? I usually get contacted when people are upset about things. <laughs> um, so, like, I've seen kind of like a chain what people contact me about. Um, and I think like, if you pay attention to the news cycle, people are getting more upset more regularly. Like I, I, um, have used this a couple of times, but like, I feel like a lot of us these days are walking around with, as like a, a sponge that's like 99 to a hundred percent saturated. And it's like one more drop and I'm going to lose it. And I think a lot of people are walking around on that kind of like on that fine line. I think we see it. Um, I think we see it like you, know, you back out of a parking space and somebody's flying through and like they're honking at you. It's like, wait a minute. Like, just chill out for a second. It, it, like everything will be okay. And so like, I try to do that when I'm outside of school. I try to just like take a breath and move on. And there are some times when I'm not so good at that. And I need to remind myself of like, like, I know I live locally. I know, and this probably helps me kind of like stay focused. I know that potentially there are kids out there that could see me at any time. I might not see them, but they could see me. So that helps me. Um, but it's not always that easy, to be honest with you. It's not. No, but like, no, but like there are places I can, you know, if I go up to Vermont, I can let my hair down a little bit, you know, but like, I was, I was somewhere a couple of years ago and then we were like, it was like a Saturday night. It was at a place up in Vermont, dancing around, whatever I look up. I'm like, that's a student in my school. I'm like, I can't escape these kids. They're everywhere. No, but like, you know, but, but at the same time, like I do say to kids sometimes, especially our eighth graders, 
um, you're all you're all of an age that you might remember this if you were paying attention at the time. Charles Barkley is a uh, is he's now on TNT, and when he was playing basketball, I think he like spit on somebody in the crowd, and they asked him about it afterwards, and they said, you know, you're a role model. Role model. And he said, I didn't ask to be a role model. It's like whether you ask to or not, people look up to you. I think it's a good reminder that for our teachers, that people look up to us, that our parents, that our kids look up to us, that our older students, that kids look up to them. Um, <clears throat> and that we all kind of like have this shared responsibility. And so like the message behind this is, I don't think anybody in this room, I don't think honestly, anybody in this school can disagree with anything that's up on, especially on that left side. But then like, okay, now we're gonna hold you accountable for that. And we're gonna say, this is what it means to be a, a member of the John Jay Middle School community. And that's where I think like our work is, is by saying like, there are a lot of middle school kids when we were growing up, they might not um, punch anybody, they might not throw anything, but a lot of kids say a lot of mean things. And if we can teach into why that's important to just be kind, and if we can like learn to know people better and understanding without judgment, like this all works together. And this is a place where yes, kids will still make mistakes, but like kids can come and not be worried about being made fun of, but worry about learning. And like, that's the most important thing. And learning a lot of different things is not just about academics. Yeah. Um, and just, just to like model this, just like from you know, a different perspective, and to really have the support of the teachers here in the school, mm -hmm. especially where we have care is in those people. Mm -hmm. At least I know when that comes home, Abby's heard this elsewhere beside. Yeah. Itself. So I, I really feel just for growing up and, and maturing. Yeah. That, that I really hope. Is something that can be driven home because when you just hear it from parents, it can only go so far. Yeah. When you hear it from teachers, which I know kids are, yeah. um, it helps tremendously. So maybe that's something you can share with me. Like, yeah. this isn't just for your classroom, yeah. but it's helping mom at home yeah. who, who yeah. is struggling with that funny thing. Yeah. Um, and I think the other piece that, that I just Certainly, it's different from home than it is at school because you have places that are for children here. But the one thing that I have always found in not only my practice, but also just with children in general, when these mistakes are made, if they're not clear on the consequences, the way I'm not going to home is okay, thank you so much yep. for. Um, if this happens again, yeah. this is what will get So it gives them, rather than immediately going down the consequence mm -hmm. route, I, hope it kind of, I feel like it helps kind of yeah. build and where the kids aren't going to be, you know, just become too much. Yeah. They messed up. Yeah. Because it's a fine line. I don't know if you can really do that here. The, yeah, I read we can, right? Because I mean, part of our focus is knowing each student individually. So really, we do need to treat each student individually. Um, and by the time they get to the consequence phase, we usually do have to meet with individual students and consider who they are. I think the the thing that whether it's in school or at home, um, well, I read an article recently, and it talked about what a lot of us don't do is say like, what is our ideal world, right? So like, ideally, what I'd love for you and your brother to do is to talk about things when you have an argument, like really stop and listen. So we can say like, be kind to each other, but that doesn't like put this like pie in the sky view. Um, and so like, that's, that's another thing that we're trying to do um, is say like, ideally, this is how we'd like you to handle it not just say, be, treat each other kindly. But yeah, the individual piece is important. Cheryl, go ahead. Okay, I, I also like that I feel like this specific language to expectation that the kids themselves can be yeah. used when they want to express to somebody mm -hmm. else, you know, what that person has done that hurts them, you know, and I think a lot of times kids don't know how to say these things yeah. to each other and, and maybe they can see 
you can start using yeah. this language. Like, if you're unkind words to yourself, yeah. you know, and that, and if that kind of makes kids reflect back to this, I don't know. So I yeah. think that could be helpful too. Right. Or I feel like your words were unkind. Yeah. 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 Um, I was just going to say, kind of to your point and, and what you were saying um, about the consequences, you know, the kids teach them that knowing is perfect and making the mistake is okay. Mm -hmm. And that's to your point about there not being consequences the first time, you know, because it is it's true. You know, we all make mistakes and, and then, but down the line, you know, yeah, it was a mistake or mm -hmm. an accident the first time, then yeah, can, um, just knowing those consequences and going to the yeah. end of their house. Yeah, I mean, like, I've I've said over the course of my career, I probably said this 25 times, but like I'll say to parents, you want to be hearing from me. You want to be hearing from the middle school principal about this. You don't want to be hearing from the high school principal about this. Like you want your child to learn and not make like face with a similar situation in the future, choosing a different action, choosing a different path. You want them to learn it now so that you don't have to hear from the high school principal because it matters a lot more in high school than it does here um we expect kids to make mistakes everybody expects kids to make mistakes you don't learn if you don't make mistakes um, but when you make them you have to learn and hopefully adjust moving forward and, um, also, your point, i think it's important that we partner with the school and the state partner with us I yeah know, i have to partner with my continuous a lot mm -hmm. And I always appreciate her support, and I know she always appreciates my support at home. I do think, you know, the more we work together, the better the outcome. Yeah. Will be. Agreed. Agreed. I've known that I wanted to share this with all of you. We've talked about it for a little while, but I feel like we're finally at the point where we're narrowing down enough that what does come out um, for next fall will not be drastically different. And then we will communicate definitely our expectations. We might not communicate every lesson, but like this left side is definitely something that you will see coming home in its final form uh, next fall. Jim, I promise this will be my last. <laughs> I promise, I promise. But I think you, know, you, you said something earlier that some of the teachers are very nervous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. It's one more thing. It's one more thing. It's to integrate it to the day. It's something that, you know, some teachers may have been trained on you yep. know, in the previous, you know, in the previous worlds. Um, but I think what's also really important is there is so much to be gained um, when adults actually can say, if a teacher, a teacher's going to say, you know, you know in the hallway, it's not right. Yeah. And what's going to yeah, happen? Correct. And, yep. you know, it just is. Um, What's so awesome about that is there's the opportunity yeah. to say, oh, you know yep. what? To talk to that student who made a mistake. Yeah. Who made a so yeah. mistake on, you know, so maybe like have the teachers look at it and say, it's really yeah. okay. And that can take the pressure off. Yeah. Just the way to learn an opportunity for the kids. Yeah. For all of us. I don't know if that anybody else here, but I need it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the, yeah, right. The um, important uh, thing that I did not say before is if you look at other PBIS matrices, matrices um, classroom is a piece of it. And then there are also other expectations for other areas. Like there will be a hallway expectation. There will be a lunchroom expectation. There will be a recess expectation. There will be a school bus or transportation expectation. So we wanted to focus on the classroom first, because if you remember the preponderance of evidence was there. And then once we get something that we like, I think we'll be able to more easily move forward. But then that means also training our bus drivers, training our monitors and the expectations for the, the um, lunchroom and recess. Um, and so the, like that's more to come. But again, we wanted our focus to be on the classroom for this year as our first step. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll just pull some groups, to be honest with you, during lunch and say, what does this mean to you?
like when you know better, do better. Like, what does that mean? It's very, it can be very general, I think, until you start adding examples. So the kids might say to us, I would expect them to say, like, we need like really good examples in order to understand what this means. Because this is very much in kind of like teacher language. Will you be saying that now? Yeah, we'll we'll ask um, again, probably during like a lunch group. If you're willing to meet with us, come sit with us and kind of talk it through. <clears throat> Good question. Thank you for asking. All right. Oh, cool. Sure, do you want to read it? All right. So. I'll read it out loud. Maybe I couldn't hear well from the home audio, so apologies that this was raised. I'm curious about how behavior, unkind language, abusive language is managed, talked about given that much of humor online, social media is mean, hostile, raging algorithms encourage rage, how to manage that. So um, how to manage that culture in the classroom, but anywhere given abusive language, mean behavior is just funny. I hear that a lot. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, we are not hearing that as much in our classrooms. Um, so again, our focus is in our classrooms. Um, but I would agree that um, trying to think of how much I want to share. Um, there are, without naming individual people, there are social influencers that really um, focus on like disconnection and um i think one of the words there was like dominance i thing. like if you know the person that i'm talking about i'd rather not name that person um but our boys are definitely connecting with an online social media personality um so just be aware of that especially if you have boys um we're not seeing that like in our classrooms as much but we do see examples of that in our maybe in our cafeteria or in our on our recess. Um, so we are setting expectations and it will get there in terms of like our school-wide expectations, um, but we are not there yet. Um, so we just, we, we enforce that through code of conduct currently. Okay, good question though, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sure. So the, yeah, so the, um, the, you probably heard about the person in, in um, online because of something that's happening overseas. Uh, the name is Andrew Tate. Um, that's, um, he's got a very strong social media presence. And the, um, the thing that he's pushing is like that you have to be like an alpha male. And there's a real push on um, like being the dominant gender, et cetera. So um, again, if you have boys, it might be worth a look up to see who this person is. I, I'm not, a, I don't think all of our boys are watching it, but a decent number are. Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. Yeah, he was, re yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like a point counterpoint. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of, I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of our a lot of our kids spend a lot of time online and we don't know where they're going online, right? But you know that if you look up something on Google, you then get advertisements for it for like a month straight. So the social media algorithms are doing the exact same thing. There are a couple of really good, I think we watched one a couple of years ago, um, like me, uh, movies about social media. I can't remember the names of them off the top of my head. The Social Dilemma, I think is one. Um, I'd, I'd encourage you to watch it. Um, social Dilemma, there's a cup. there's like, uh, I think it's like Childhood 3.0 or something like that. There's a couple of good um, videos that are out there, docu documentaries, pseudo documentaries, to kind of take you through the algorithm of social media and what's happening to kids. It's really narrowing down and focusing them. So if you watch one Andrew Tate clip, you could get several. It could end up in your feed. 
Oh, so thank, you. thank you. All right, so we will end our um, virtual audience. Thank you very much for joining us. And again, thank you to the PTO for hosting these and sending out the invitations. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Okay. Any other questions any of you have? I, I hate mentioning people like in a in an online um, 